And probably that's his way of doing it. Hello, my name is Jeff Steinberg. I want to welcome you to a very special edition of the LaRouche Connection. Today, it is my great privilege uh, to introduce as our guest for the next hour, Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, uh, a distinguished career military officer, uh, an historian, an author, uh, an expert on the international railroad industry. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Colonel Prouty from his 1970s book, The Secret Team, which has now recently been republished and is once again available. And uh, of course, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people in the United States and around the world are familiar with Colonel Prouty as the real live character upon whom the figure of Mr. X in the recent Oliver Stone movie JFK was based. Uh, Colonel Prouty has recently published a new book called JFK, the CIA, and the plot, the, JF, uh, the CIA, Vietnam, and the plot to kill John Kennedy. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Colonel Prouty here to the show today. Uh, I thought that it would be sensible, rather than giving a long sort of a curriculum vitae introduction, to ask you to start off by telling our audience a little bit about yourself, your career, because it is so extraordinary and is such an important backdrop to the discussion that we're going to have about the book today. You know, Jeff, I came on duty actually as an Army cavalryman. I've ridden horses as far as 600 miles, you know, day after day. <laughs> Started with that, went in the tanks. So I was on duty before Pearl Harbor. And uh, after then, I went through flying school. And I was based in Cairo. And one day, I was asked uh, to pick up a team of people that were going on a trip. And they were a geological survey team going into Saudi Arabia to look at the oil fields there during the war. And then we came back and we found out that Roosevelt, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek were having a conference in Cairo, the Cairo Conference of World War II, and that the geological survey people made a report to Roosevelt who ordered immediately a 50,000 barrel a day refinery to be built in Saudi Arabia. And that started that big Saudi Arabian oil boom that we've seen since then. So when you take part in something like that early in your career, you're kind of interested in the way things develop. And uh, a morning or two later, after the Cairo conference ended, I was told to get my plane ready. Went out to the plane, and they brought Chinese delegation out there. And we flew to Tehran. I didn't know what was going to happen in Tehran, but I had just been ordered to fly there. En route, I stopped at Habanier in Iraq, and a plane came in with an old friend of mine flying it, and Elliot Roosevelt. So I introduced Elliot Roosevelt to the Chinese. But do you know, to this day, you cannot find in a history book that the Chinese were at the Tehran Conference with Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill. I, I know one book printed by the U.S. government that corroborates that. Of course, I have pictures, and, and my co-pilot and my crew were there. But part of the Tehran Conference business was to make plans for the Far East after World War II. So you begin to think about how these things happen when they come up like that. And I was in Japan at the end of the war. We were bringing the POWs out as soon as we could. And I went back to Okinawa, where we were based. And they were loading ships with this enormous stockpile of equipment that was to be used to support the invasion of Japan, 500,000 men, and we didn't need it. So I was talking with the harbor master in Naha. And I said, what are you going to do, run that all back to the States? He said, hell no. He said, half of this is going up to Seoul, Korea. And he said, the other half we're sending down to Hanoi. Half of what we were going to use to go into Japan went to Korea, and half went to Hanoi. This was September 2nd of 1945, and those plans were in being at that time. Now, who made those plans? Truman had been president for only a few months. I doubt that he did, but you know, who made the plans for that? Because a little later came the Korean War, and they used the weapons we sent there. Came the war in Vietnam, and Ho Chi Minh was using the weapons we gave him. He used them against the French. That's why the if he was able to surprise the French with first-class artillery pieces that they didn't think he had. Then we reversed the field and we began to back the French to the extent that we spent two to three billion dollars supporting the French against Ho Chi Minh 
1954, they were defeated at Dien Bien Phu. Ho Chi Minh inherited all of the arms they lost. And then from 54 until 65, we were involved in Vietnam, but under the operational control of CIA, not a military operation. And this gets very important when you see things like that happen because, well, just think of one problem in the papers all the time, the POWs and the MIAs. You don't have POWs when you don't have an army there. Just because somebody's working for CIA doesn't give them the status of a POW and so on. All these things get confused in a hist historical story that doesn't really make sense. The first military people who went into Vietnam were the Marines at Da Nang in March of 1965. And yet, as John Foster Dulles had made a speech himself, we had been in Vietnam since 1945, 20 years in the preparation, you might say, for this war. And then why do I use the word preparation? Because some of the things that were done, like this arms movement and setting up the units in Vietnam before we ever had military people there, took 20 years to do that. You made well, a point, by the way, I, I should mm -hmm. just interrupt here because I think it, it's, it's very important because people may be somewhat misled by the title of the book, which talks about the JFK assassination. I think it's, it's essential to tell people that this is truly an extraordinary history of the entire period of what's been called the Cold War, building up to the <clears throat> Kennedy assassination and beyond. And uh, the question you yourself just posed, who made those decisions? Uh, in the very beginning chapter of the book, uh, you use a term that I think was originally coined by Buck Buckminster Fuller, the international power elite. And you talk in what to me was very impressive terms about some of these behind the scenes decision makers. You talked about the propaganda schemes that sort of define their world outlook. And I think, you know, maybe it would be worthwhile as we get into this real history of the Cold War to perhaps start out by just telling people a little bit about this international power elite and these propaganda schemes and how some of this thing works. Well, you know, it's, it's very common for people to respond when you try to speak that way, saying, oh, well, here's somebody that just believes in uh, conspiratorial theories or is a little bit paranoid. But now we ought to stop and think carefully what we're talking about. All of history has been controlled by powerful figures. Disraeli in the 19th century said, for those people who are not aware of it, to, if they realize what goes on behind government, they wouldn't believe it. Sun Tzu, the Chinese emperor, said the same thing back in his period. Buck Buster Fuller goes back 2,000 years talking about the elite. And in this country today, we recognize the power behind, let's say, lobbyists who are, in a sense, above the government in, this, in that they pay special money to the president to get him reelected. They pay special money to senators and congressmen to get them reelected, but to influence legislation in their favor. And there is and has been throughout history an elite that runs countries and the world. What is this one world all about? And if we don't recognize that, it's very difficult to understand the situation we're in. You make a point several times in the book about the outlook of a British East India Company economist named Thomas Malthus, and you relate his worldview to this power elite and specifically to the kinds of things that went on <clears throat> during the peak of the Vietnam War in the 60s. You see, by that time in history, the British Empire had been built on the control of the sea. They were able to drive ships around the world. They knew the world was a sphere. A flat world had gone out. But knowing that the world is a sphere is a very important thing for mankind. It means its surface is finite. And if it's finite, then there's not more space over there and more there. It's, it's just so much so they began immediately to inventory Earth. And this was one of the jobs of the, of the East India companies. And Thomas Malthus, who taught at Haleybury College, which was the East India College, was the director of, of economics there. And it was his job, it was, he was the first person ever assigned to the job of inventorying the Earth. Where does tin come from? Where does iron come from? 
and so on. And in the process, they began to find out how many different people there were in the world, how many different types of people, how many races of people, and where everything was, began to map the world. Well, that's a very important function, but it leads you to one more thing that has governed uh, relationship between countries ever since then, because Malthus came up with this idea that the population is growing ever so much faster than the ability to raise food. And therefore, it wouldn't be long before mankind would run out of food and there would be a terrible loss of life. And it was very convenient that Darwin came along, working for the same employer, the East India Company, with the idea that, well, life is a race for the survival of the fittest anyway, <clears throat> and so the fittest survive. Now those two theories, which are propaganda, sort of made it legal for the people who invaded, the colonialists, to kill off a couple hundred thousand people because first of all, they, they, they probably weren't going to get to eat anyway, and certainly they weren't the fittest because they're not alive now, they're dead, we're the fittest. It backed up the idea of this proprietary colonialism that swept the world from that period right on up into the 19th century and in some respects uh, applies today because look what's going on in Europe. Look what went on in Vietnam where hundreds of thousands of people were killed and the feeling was, you know, what they used to call the mere gook idea that, uh, well, it doesn't matter. They're, they're not, they're not going to live anyway. It's a very powerful underpinning to the civilization today. You uh, point out that in a certain sense, this 30-year American war in Indochina and this whole process of the preparation for the Korean War then Vietnam uh, was going on even before the war ended. And it, it, it's, it's quite striking that it seems to me what you're saying is that even though 1944 and 1945 the Soviet Union was still part of the Allied forces fighting against Nazi Germany and Japan, that we were already beginning to prepare the way for the new war, the Cold War, with communism as the big enemy. Is this, is this an accurate Well, you know, you, of you are correct. Uh, it, the beginning of the Cold War is indefinite in a sense, but it's not. You can trace it back. I myself, as a pilot, transport pilot, was asked one day to take about 40 transport aircraft to the north of Syria. Uh, the general ordered me to go from Cairo, and we were going on the orders of OSS people who were in Bucharest, Romania, who they claim had released American prisoners who were captured in the Balkans and the Germans had just been pushed out of the Balkans and the Russians were on the way in. So in the interim between the two, they brought out about 750 American POWs and they were on a freight train and they ran a freight train through Turkey to the northern border of Syria. And we had our planes parked there and the men jumped out of the train, climbed in our planes and we started flying them back to Cairo. I noticed on my own plane there were five or six men who obviously weren't Americans. They're perfectly willing to talk. I went back and talked with them. They were pro-Nazi Romanians. They were intelligence specialists who were bringing out intelligence files not only of Eastern Europe but of the Soviet Union area. In other words, here in September 1944, while we were fighting hard as partners of the Soviet, we were already building up a Nazi base of intelligence against the Soviet. I mean, the Cold War was already in motion. Why don't we take a look at history the way it happened instead of all these embellishments that are thrown our way? The Cold War started while we were still fighting and we, in a sense, had allies on both sides, German allies, and we were still allied with the, with the Soviets. One of the other very critical events in more contemporary history, which has been written about at great length, but uh, I think has been uniquely presented in your book, both uh, because of your position at the time in the Pentagon, which gave you a particular angle on it, and also your subsequent work as an historian. Uh, and I'm talking about the Bay of Pigs, which uh, according to your book, did not at all occur in the way that most official histories present it today. I'd like you to maybe tell our audience a little bit about that because it's such a critical event. Well, I went into the Pentagon in 1955 and the National Security Council had just directed uh, 
that whenever the United States was involved in clandestine activities, that that clandestine activity would be supported by the military, but managed by the CIA. This is the first time they defined it that way and clearly. So the Chief of Staff Air Force called me in and said, look, we want you to set up this organization, a global organization, to provide the military support that is requested for the clandestine activities of CIA. Now, this got to be a very large organization because we had operations in Indonesia and in Tibet, well, all over the world. So in that capacity, early in 1960, I was approached by two CIA men who told me about the plan that eventually became the Bay of Pigs. It wasn't called that then, but it was eventually became that. And they needed a base to train Cuban exiles. So we arranged to fly to Panama, and we opened up Fort Gulick, a, a boat base that had been closed. It was a very fine facility, just exactly what they wanted. And the training began at Fort Gulick, and we had to provide them with housing, with doctors, and everything else it took to train the, the uh, Cuban exiles. Then we built an air base at Retalaleo in Guatemala and another one in uh, Puerto Cabezas in Nicaragua, a big base near Ch uh, Lake Pontchartrain near New Orleans, and of course the biggest CIA station in the world in the Miami area, all the time enlisting Cubans. So that by the time of the presidential election in 1960, Kennedy versus Nixon, this was a very big issue, this, this business of uh, overcoming Castro in Cuba. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of people concede that Kennedy defeated Nixon because of his sense of the Cuban invasion requirement in the fourth debate when he said that we ought to be uh, preparing ourselves to remove Castro and Nixon didn't say anything as he later said because he knew the plan was in effect and it was highly classified and he assumed Kennedy didn't. But for example, the debate was in October. In August of 1960, again, because of my job, I was sent to the Senate office building, to Senator Kennedy's office. I had to bring two staff cars over there, and there were four men in the office, Cubans, and they were the head of what became the Bay of Pig program. One of whom was Devarona, another one Cardona, and Manuel Artima. Artima was the, the military commander on the beach. Picked them up and came. Well, Kennedy knew them. They were already there. They'd been talking to each other. They, they, uh, Kennedy had known them. Had, our team had been at his home at West Palm Beach. People think Kennedy didn't know what was going on or that he didn't know the Cubans and didn't know their aspirations. He certainly did. He knew before many others did. And then I brought them over to the Pentagon to meet with um, uh, the Secretary of Defense at the time, who was Mr. Gates. And, but you see, people attribute to Kennedy a lack of knowledge of this when really that's not accurate. And from this beginning, we finally got to the point where a brigade had been formed and trained and equipped to invade Cuba and at the Bay of Pigs. And the requirement, the absolutely essential requirement of that attack was that every Castro combat aircraft would be destroyed before the brigade landed at dawn on April 17th. Now, there were only 10 planes. It wasn't a big deal. On Saturday morning, the 16th, the 15th, seven of the 10 had been destroyed. But three jets, three we call T-birds, T-33s, had flown down to Santiago, Cuba, quite by chance. And our U-2s found them that afternoon. So on Monday morning, before dawn, Four B-26s were ordered by President Kennedy himself to attack those jets and destroy them. Now, this is very crucial because if those three planes were destroyed, there were no aircraft for Castro's Air Force. There would be no requirement for air cover and all these stories that have developed since then. The facts are that Kennedy, on that Sunday afternoon, when he approved the landings with the proviso that there be this airstrike to destroy them. And that's the critical step in the Bay of Pigs understanding. That Kennedy did not withhold air cover or anything else. He followed the plan as it was drawn by a, a very able Marine colonel and approved by the Joint Chiefs of Staff to destroy all combat aircraft. And they weren't destroyed. That was the problem. What happened? Why weren't they destroyed? Well, this is a bit of history. And it's contentious, I'll admit. But this document is 
the document prepared by the Cuban study group. The Cuban study group was assigned by Kennedy the day after the surrender of the brigade in Cuba on the 22nd of April, 1961. The group was very interesting. If you ever could think of four different people trying to work together, it was Maxwell Taylor, the retired General Chief of Staff of the Army. It was Alan Dulles, whom, uh, who was head of the CIA, but who was not in town at the time of the invasion of Cuba for some reason or other. Uh, Admiral Arleigh Burke, the head of the Navy, who had had more to do with the Bay of Pigs program than the chairman had, so Arleigh Burke was asked to be there. And then the real point of interest in the group, Bobby Kennedy. Sure. Now they met, I think I made a note on this, yes, they met two doors from my office. The, 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 door in the, the room in the Pentagon mm -hmm. is listed on the page there. They met two doors from my office sure. for all their inquiries. Now the reason I present this is, this is a true copy of the report that Taylor gave to uh, the president. And in this report, it states what the committee came up with as a reason for the failure of the program. And I'll just read it right out of here because I don't want anybody to differ with the way it should go. At about 9.30 p.m. on the 16th of April, Mr. McGeorge Bundy, special assistant to the president, telephoned General Cabell of the CIA to inform him that the dawn airstrikes the following morning should not be launched until they could be conducted from a strip within the beachhead. In other words, after they took the beachhead. Mr. Bundy indicated that any further consultation with regard to this matter should be with the Secretary of State. General Cabell, accompanied by Mr. Bissell of CIA, went at once to Secretary Rusk's office, arriving at about 10.15. Now, there's no sense of going further on that, but the, the entire thing is documented that the failure to fly that strike is why the thing failed. And back in the report further are the words of Dr. Deverona, who would have been the, the new president of Cuba had they won, and he said, we would be in Havana today if those three jets had been destroyed. Now, anybody that writes otherwise is just misinformed. There are the official papers. Now, let me ask you now. Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, is out of town. McGeorge Bundy, President Kennedy's national security advisor, countermands the military plan for the Bay of Pigs. And as the result of that countermanding, there's a fiasco instead of a victory. Uh, what kind of conclusion do you draw from this? Were there senior people in the Kennedy administration who were consciously out to sabotage this in order to somehow or other weaken the Kennedy presidency or what? I mean, history generally attributes the failure to John Kennedy, not McGeorge Bundy. But what you're saying here is extraordinarily important. Well, uh, I, think, I think it is. I think it really is. But I think we should also put it in the time, be, be very careful Hindsight doesn't make a good historian. And the Kennedy <clears throat> administration was new in April of 60. They had been there just February months. and March. Sure. Yeah. You know, fairly new. You could not expect that the civilian element of the administration would necessarily have a lot of military experience. And as the paper goes on to show, that some of the people who were briefed about the significance of destroying all the aircraft first didn't realize that three little jets up against a whole fleet of B-26s, we had, we had armed the, the exiles with, with B-26s, but they're slower than the jets, see, so they couldn't fight them. They didn't think that it would make that much difference. And I'm willing to side with Admiral Burke and General Taylor in saying, as they do further on, that there were misunderstandings. They didn't understand the tactical problem. Well, we could leave it there. Some people would like to squeeze it up a little tighter mm -hmm. and say that it was countermanding the president. Uh, I think that should be a matter of choice. What I'm interested in doing is presenting the record, and the record says the words I just read. They don't give a reason, but I'd like you to keep this in mind. Every day, the questions were asked of the people in that room by this committee. Bobby Kennedy left immediately in the afternoon back to the White House to talk with his brother, the president. Had there been any doubt in his mind or in the president's mind that this report, that Bundy did this on his own, is right, 
they would have stopped immediately. They would have said, well, now, wait a minute. Uh, Kennedy told Bundy to do this, or somebody else told him. But there was no one else seeing it. That's silent. So we have to be a little careful about that. But the record speaks for itself pretty clearly. It was a very bad blunder. What happened is the result of that. Kennedy's presented with the Taylor report, the Taylor Cuban study group report. Uh, what does he do on the basis of that? Very interesting step, because in this report is not only the requirement to study the failure, but Kennedy had decided that he was not going to rely on the CIA anymore, and that he was going to have to have a, an alternative system created for the operation of clandestine operations of the United States government. And in this report, there are the words that are written by the people in the committee and by General Taylor primarily that became one of the most important national security action memorandum ever published by Kennedy. And that's the highest document our government can publish, number 55, issued in July of 1961. And essentially it says that the president holds the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff responsible for advice to him in peacetime operations, meaning clandestine operations, as he would be in wartime. Now, right away, that meant that the JCS was going to be in, in charge of these things. Programs would be run by the JCS under the direction of the NSC, and the CIA would not be in clandestine operations. A powerful statement translated by Senator Mansfield and uh, uh, Justice Douglas, both friends of Kennedy, that Kennedy was going to destroy the CIA into a thousand pieces. Well, that's another way to say it. But what is actually said are the words that the Joint Chiefs of Staff would be responsible for the present for advice, and they would carry out. Then, also in this report, is a long section on what the alternative system would be when the, when the CIA was not involved. Of course, the events at the Bay of Pigs occur at a kind of a critical juncture in the whole development of the Vietnam engagement of the United States. As you point out uh, throughout the book, uh, the U.S. involvement in Indochina, uh, what you refer to as a 30 years war, began in 1945. Um, one of the things that was very striking to me was your description of a series of uh, rather significant steps that were taken with U.S. involvement in Indochina, uh, a large relocation of population, some rather significant measures that disrupted the traditional culture and <coughs> economic infrastructure of the country. And what you more or less seem to be suggesting is that these blunders, these actions taken without a real appreciation of the culture of the area, uh, had as much to do with creating the conditions of chaos and warfare in Vietnam as anything else. I, I, I'd like you to tell our listeners something about this because, again, it's a rather unique vantage point view of what actually went wrong in Vietnam. I mentioned earlier that we had armed and equipped Ho Chi Minh, which would surprise a lot of people now, but that's how it happened. And then we broke away from that and began to arm the French until, he was, until the French were defeated at the Dien Bien Phu in 1954. In 54, there was an agreement in Geneva that the country would be separated at the 17th parallel into North Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh and South Vietnam under a, a question mark for a little while, Bao Dai, the old king. But very shortly, under No Dinh Diem, an exile Vietnamese brought in there by the United States and made president of Vietnam about June or July of 54. But of equal importance, in January and February of 1954, the subject of what to do in Vietnam had come up several times. And people should be familiar with the fact, and I very carefully cite this from records, that Eisenhower, in speaking to the National Security Council, said he would never, he bitterly opposed the words he used, to the introduction of American troops into Vietnam. He would never approve that. In less than a month from that meeting, the Dulles brothers and others, Secretary of Defense and some others, were meeting on what was called the, the Vietnam Committee of the National Security Council. And they approved an idea that Mr. Dulles came, and Mr. Alan Dulles came up with, the Director of Central Intelligence, to introduce just five men into Vietnam as more or less special advisors with the 
support forces there that were there to aid this, uh, get the country started. You know, as a country that had no existence, it had to get started. And he called that unit the Saigon Military Mission, put it under the control of uh, Colonel Lansdale in the Philippines and other men. One of the first things they did was to use the paragraph in the Geneva Agreements that in all fairness, it appeared, said, any North Vietnamese who would rather be in the South is free to go, and any South Vietnamese who would rather be in the North is free to go. What the Saigon military mission did was go into North Vietnam and through all kinds of acts, terrorism, propaganda, frightening the people and everything else, they managed unbelievably to cause 1,100,000 of those North Vietnamese to move to South Vietnam. Now, it wasn't all done quite that simple. The U.S. Navy transports carried 660,000 on U.S. Navy vessels. In my book, I have photographs of the operation, just so people will know it really took place. CIA's aircraft, the Civil Air Transport Airline, which is a proprietary airline CIA, carried between three and 400,000. Now, there's only one port in South Vietnam. That's at Saigon. So they have to go down the coast and up the river to Saigon and then turn these million people loose. Now, can you just picture what would happen if a million people from New York were all of a sudden taken to Kansas City and just dumped loose, no money, no home, no food, no automobile, no TV, no nothing, you know, what are you going to do with them? Well, that's what happened in Vietnam. These people became rioters. They were, you know, trying to get food. They didn't have drinking water. You can be up to your knees all day in a rice paddy, but you can't drink that water, and so on. A terrible situation came up, such, such that you'll remember the days when the fighting in Vietnam took place south of Saigon, north up in the north. If the Ca Canadians were going to fight this country, would we expect the war to take place in Florida? Well, that's what was going on. This was a make-war deal, going back to the Malthusian theory that, well, these poor folks aren't going to make it anyway, so if we kill off that million or million and a half or four million, as was more likely the number, uh, you know, so what? And that kind of thinking took place in that country. And the, 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 the wartime fodder, the people that get shot at and chased around, to a great degree, were these million. Now, in the million, there were many fifth columnists put there very... Uh, alertly by Ho Chi Minh and his forces. That exacerbated the problem. So when Vietnam came into being with that kind of a problem, and, and what do you do when you create a country today and you expect it to defend itself tomorrow? No army, no police, no tax system. You know, you, you don't create a country in a day. And this was another problem, and we never really recognized it properly. Eisenhower himself in 54 said, we should let the Viet Vietnamese fight their own war. Well, <laughs> it's a nice thing to think about, but they had no means of fighting the war. And the other man, armed to the teeth with weapons that we had brought to Vietnam, it was crawling all over him, you see. We don't really understand the background history of the Vietnam War. All we remember is that Marines invaded Vietnam in 1965 and we had 550,000 American soldiers there by 1969 or so. Well, sure that was a big war then, but when it's those first 20 years were what I'm talking about. And another thing is all of that first 20 years was when the leading operating commanders were all CIA people carrying on clandestine warfare as they had been ordered to do. They didn't invent it, they were ordered to do it, which changes Vietnam history a little bit. So you're basically saying, I gather, that some of the activity in the South that was being generally transmitted back to the United <coughs> States on the 6 o'clock news as communist insurgency, Viet Cong operations, and the rest was a consequence of a chaotic situation, banditry and these kinds of things brought about by starvation and the policy of this mass migration of this million or so people down from the north. And read then, today's paper, read tomorrow's paper. What's going on in Yugoslavia? What makes people fight in the streets in situations like that, and particularly in Vietnam in, in back in 54 and 55, is, is hunger. I mean, they had nothing. You dump these people, a million people loose in a place you know, Vietnam is in probably as old a part of the world, has a history as old as any part of the world. 
It's, it is an ancestral ground type society. They never leave the ground where their ancestors were. The place where the ancestors' bones are buried is sacred to them. They don't jump in a nearest Honda and drive off to the nearest McDonald's. They, they stay right, right where sure. they live. Exactly. And to already pick up a million of them and move them down to the south and just turn them loose, why, that created a war. And if you remember the geography of the war, when this uh, very famous man, John Paul Van, had been made general, he wasn't a military general, he was sort of made a general by the civilians, and not CIA, it was an aid program, I think. Where did they put him to fight? South of Saigon, you see? Ooh. And there's where the war, and then as the war went and it bloomed up into a major debacle, for instance, do you realize we lost over 5,000 helicopters in Vietnam? Over one-third of the men who died in Vietnam died in helicopter crashes, helicopter operations, even just in uh, helicopters crashing by themselves. Mm -hmm. Over one-third of the men are attributed to helicopters. That's an expensive business. I think you said that the cost of the Vietnam War, just in terms of military hardware, somewhere in the book, was about 230 or 240 billion dollars. Um, on this Vietnam question, uh, was Kennedy actually about to cancel the plans to move U.S. military forces in a large-scale way into Vietnam? Was this an important <clears throat> aspect of why Kennedy was assassinated? Uh, again, as I've said earlier, Jeff, um, you, you can't write history with hindsight. So your word cancel, I would cancel also, <laughs> because in 1960, just to give you a good example, Time magazine mentioned Vietnam six times. That's how important it was. They mentioned football more than that. Um, by 1962, there were about 15 to 16,000 men in Vietnam, and many of them were the, the helicopter maintenance people for all these helicopters that were out there that where CIA was operating and other logistics people. So that by the end of 1962, the general who was out there, Harkins, asked for more troops. He said, I, I got people here, 15, 16,000, but I don't have any combat people. And General Wheeler, the uh, director of the, of the um, Joint Staff at that time, and the man that brought me down to the JCS and set up my office there, had a report made of that, and they found out that, that less than 1,600 men were really combat experienced, and they were training this new Vietnamese army. And that was what Kennedy had when he was making the studies about Vietnam. So there were no orders to build up. It was a question of whether in the future he would do that. So during 63, beginning, we'll say, in August, my own boss, General Krulak, the Marine boss, uh, General, was in the Pentagon at least 30 different, I mean in the, in the White House, excuse me, at least 30 times at meetings with Rusk and McNamara and other leaders deciding on the policy of Vietnam all under the close eye of Kennedy. Now this is all in a wonderful book that the government has published on the, the, uh, the foreign relations of the United States, a recent volume that goes from just August 63 to December 50, 63, published in 1991, and it explains Vietnam better than anything's ever been written. And when it finally came time for Kennedy to issue orders about Vietnam, he took a report that was written by McNamara and Taylor, Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Secretary of Defense, and accepted their report, which meant that the Vietnamese now by 1963, could stand on their own feet, provided we gave them money and weapons and so on, but we didn't need troops. And in that report, NSAM 263, it said we'll take home a thousand men by Christmas and all U.S. personnel out of Vietnam by 1965. You may have seen the picture in my book. I took the front page of the Army's own newspaper, Stars and Stripes, and showed that banner across the top. People that say there was nothing in history that would prove that Kennedy was saying that ought to read just that paper itself. Other papers, of course, said the same thing. Kennedy was taking Americans, uh, American personnel, it didn't say military, all American personnel out of Vietnam by 65. That was his key plan. He was going to run for president again in 64. He knew he would win, and in 65, he'd have, he was not going to bring Americans into Vietnam. And that's one of the key things that we made as a point of Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. We said Kennedy was not going to put Americans in Vietnam. 
Let me actually ask you about that. As I said at the beginning of the show, uh, many millions of people around the world have by now been introduced to you, at least indirectly, through the character of the Mr. X in Oliver Stone's movie JFK. Uh, you were in correspondence and communication with Oliver Stone throughout much of the preparation and making of the movie. And of course, prior to that, you had a uh, correspondence and uh, working relationship with Jim Garrison. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I know you know that Garrison wrote a book uh, on the Trail of the Assassin. Right. And because we had corresponded for years, he sent me a manuscript of his book. And I thought the book was wonderful, but <laughs> it was the story of Miami, New Orleans, Dallas, and it didn't think about Washington, New York, Frankfurt, Germany, the money centers. And to me, you got to follow the money line. So I would write to Jim and I'd say, look, the book is good, but we need to put this in or this. And he respected that. And later, sometime, I don't really know when, we weren't that close, he was talking with Oliver Stone. Stone had an idea of doing this movie. And in the process, showed Stone some of this material that I had written. So Stone called me in uh, July of 1990. And he said, I'm going to be in Washington. I'd like to have meet you. And I want you to work as an advisor of this movie I'm planning. So we met. And we got along just fine. And I told him I agreed to be an advisor and work with him. So the, the material, and much of it, is straight out of the book. The words that you remember from the film are in the book. And that part of the book I had written in 1985. It was already uh -huh. a series of articles that had been published, already published. And it was based on that that the ending of the movie, where Donald Sutherland, who played my part, comes in and talks to uh, Kevin Costner, who played Jim Garrison's part, and they begin to describe why was Kennedy killed. Not who did it and all that sort of thing, or who's covering it up, but why was Kennedy killed? And this is what I tried to answer during that bit of the movie. I think uh, the movie uh, very much benefited from that scene because it gave the audience a chance to get the bigger picture. And I must say that uh, as good as I found the movie to be, I think the, the book, your new book, uh, really goes much further in terms of really elaborating on that critical question, qui bono. Um, apropos of the Kennedy assassination aspect of the book, um, I think the question that uh, everybody who was alive at the time and old enough to remember uh, is always asked and uh, it's always very useful to know is where were you when John Kennedy was assassinated? You were presumably still active duty in the Pentagon at this time. I would think given your capacity that you would have been in a sort of a critical position to at least have some window on the security concerns in Dallas and things like that. Were you in Dallas that day? Were you well, in Washington? Or? In November of 1963 I was the chief of special operations which is supporting clandestine operations, CIA, uh, for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And uh, rather an unusual meeting, I was walking down the hall in October, and a general said, oh, uh, glad to see you, Prouty. I wanted to talk with you. He said, you are being ordered to go to the South Pole with a group of VIP people who are going down there to install a nuclear plant. And I thought, well, nice vacation, but you know, <laughs> nuclear is not my business. I've been here nine years in the Pentagon now, all on one kind of job. But, I, but we had some CIA activity in, in um, Antarctica, uh, but not enough to warrant a trip down there. So I accepted it in good faith. I saw no problems with it. And the next thing I know, November 10th, I'm on a plane on the way to Honolulu, down to New Zealand, and down to McMurdo Sound, and to the South Pole. And uh, we fired up the nuclear plant. And at McMurdo and then came back to Christchurch, New Zealand. By that time I'd gotten to know a congressman who was a member of the party quite well and we were sitting down to breakfast. I, would, I never, never forget this because down there that was Saturday morning when, when the president was killed and all of a sudden the uh, radio in the place said, ladies and gentlemen, BBC have announced that Kennedy, President Kennedy, has been killed in Dallas. Boy, you could have heard a pin drop clear to Australia. Stunning news, you know. So there was nothing we could do. That was all. There wasn't a radio station. We didn't have radios. So after we finished breakfast, we went out on the street. A few hours later, we, I was able to buy a newspaper, the Christchurch Star, which I still have, which was in the movie, by the way. Jeff, remember Sutherland? Right, I do, sure, yeah. And uh, 
I looked at the paper, at the terrible news, and of course had nothing else to balance it against except some of my own experience. I had worked on the business of presidential protection. You know, the military is trained in presidential protection. I had gone to Mexico City, for example, with Eisenhower when he went there in 56 or 57 and so on. I was familiar with it. And at times I had to call certain units to be in certain places to provide extra support to the Secret Service. So we were looking at the paper, and up in the corner is a picture of this building where the, the, the man that shot the president was alleged to have hidden, uh, called the Texas School Book Depository Building. And, and as I looked, I saw the windows were open. And I turned to Congressman, I said, Pete, something's wrong. We don't allow that. When the windows would be sealed. If the military were there, if the Secret Service was there, those windows would be sealed. Then right beside the picture was a headline that said, three bursts of automatic weapon fire killed the president. Of course, having nothing else to go by, I figured that's the way he died. Three bursts of automatic weapon fire. And you know what we have heard now, three bullets from an old rifle up on the top of the building. Go boom, boom, boom. Now, reporters on the spot know the difference between an automatic weapon and the Then down in the lower corner of the paper, very interestingly, it gave the whole biographical story of this young man, Lee Harvey Oswald. And of course, we read every word of that inside the thing, and a whole bunch of it on the inside page, plus a picture of Oswald in a nice business suit, white shirt on, necktie on. Have you ever seen a picture of Oswald dressed like that? Of all, when I got back to the States, I kept looking through newspapers everywhere to find a picture of Oswald in a business suit. But that's what had been sent by radio photo somehow to the newspapers around the world before the police in Dallas had arranged, arraigned him. I took that paper home and I, through my resources in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I made phone calls and checked things out. That information that appeared in that paper about Oswald's biography and everything, all of that part of it, had been written and sent before the police in Dallas had arraigned the man. How could a reporter be working on just some 24-year-old boy and, and have the story all ready to go if he didn't know from the police who they had charged with the crime. So ever since then, I've been building up more and more information to see these things that were manufactured as a cover story ever since that murder. And of course, the biggest cover story is the Warren Commission report. Now, let me make sure I get this straight. November 23rd, 1963, in New Zealand, Australia area is November 22nd in the United States. Yes, in other words, same. this is really the same day. This over is the, not the following the day. Line. No, it's over the date line. Mm -hmm. That's right. And this newspaper in an obscure area of New Zealand, this was? Well, it's a big city in South, mm -hmm. South Island, Christchurch, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so in other words, this story, this, this biographical profile, as well as the details of the assassination, was about the very first news coverage that reached Australia, yeah, New Zealand. And all prepackaged, see? Now, in a few minutes like this, Jeff, I can't go through the whole thing, but to give you some relevancy here, the president was shot at 12.30 in Dallas. We heard it at 7.30 in New Zealand the next day, but that'll give you how many hours it was. In the book, I go through it very carefully, mm -hmm. and it comes out. And it just you just see that somebody had prepared this whole story to make Oswald the patsy, just as he said he was, just like in the movie. They said that he, he said he was the patsy, and, and he was created for that job, which tells you really more about the whole crime than most of us have been willing to accept until we begin to realize the facts of life. The, uh, the events of the Kennedy assassination, um, obviously you don't believe for a minute from reading the book and from other things that that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin of John Kennedy. Uh, you pointed out to me uh, quite a few months ago in an earlier discussion that we had that shortly before his death, President Lyndon Johnson had made some comments about the Kennedy assassination. Uh, could you tell us about that? It was an interview, well, I believe, you know, somewhere? That's, well, that's one of the most interesting things I have read since the assassination, because you know a lot of people say, well, of course Lyndon Johnson was implicated, and so on and so on. It couldn't possibly be. But just before Johnson died in 73, he had had some serious heart trouble, and uh, I'm sure the gentleman knew that he, w he didn't have long to live. He had an old friend who was a writer named Leo Janos, and Janos wrote for the Atlantic Monthly Magazine. 
So anyone who's interested should look in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine of July 1973. And I'll quote the best I can. Johnson told Janus he always believed there was a conspiracy. Now that's a pretty big statement for the man that appointed the Warren Commission. It's a pretty big statement. But he told him there was always believed there was a conspiracy. Second, he said, although Oswald may have pulled the trigger, he wasn't the only one. So he wasn't alone. The third statement hits like a thunderclap. He said, we have been running a damn murder incorporated in the government. Now, through my work, regrettably so, I have to admit that we do run a murder incorporated. I know where they were. I know most of them are foreigners. I know how they're used and have used them. And I know how they do the job. And it's nothing like Lee Harvey Oswald up sitting on a windowsill. When Johnson said those three things, anybody could wrap up the murder and find out what the problem is right there. Now, nobody, I'm sure, knew the situation closer than Johnson. Remember, for over 19 years, right here in Washington, DC, Johnson's across the street neighbor was J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover and Johnson were that close. What Hoover <laughs> knew, Johnson knew, except on betting on horses. But other than that, Hoover knew what Johnson knew and vice versa. So there's no surprises when you read that this is what Johnson thought in 1973. A kind of an evaluative question, which I guess asks you to take a great deal of the material that's extraordinarily well documented in the book and sort of put it in a few brief sentences. Uh, obviously, as you emphasize, the question of who were the actual trigger men is of relatively secondary importance as to who were the actual authors and controllers of the, of the operation. Uh, do you think it's fair to say that the motives behind the Kennedy assassination uh, had to do with the sort of monumental policy changes that he was about to affect and that uh, could you give a sort of a characterization of who, in general terms, you think was responsible for this? Well, that's a good way to put it. There, there's no way in a brief period, I've done it as best I can through the book, to explain that when Kennedy became president, one of the first moves he made, he gave McNamara orders to hold up on the TFX contract. Now everybody kind of forget that, but that was a, a very advanced fighter plane contract worth six and a half billion dollars in 1961 money, which is a big contract. That's only letting the contract. They usually run 10 times that through what we call life of type. That was big money. They held up the contract, and finally, by a specialized system that McNamara and uh, Arthur Goldberg, the Secretary of Labor, set up, they allocated this, the contract to a company that had created an area of subcontracting throughout the country in the political counties where Kennedy needed the vote most. Remember, Kennedy got, a vote, got elected by, a, by the skin of his sure. teeth. So where he had beaten Nixon by only a few votes, well, put a little factory there. Where Nixon had beaten him a little bit, put a bigger factory there. And they had it spread. It was a beautiful plan. It took walls of the Pentagon covered with these maps. And then McNamara, on the 23rd of November, 1962, allocated that contract. Well, in the halls of the Pentagon, you couldn't hear a civil word. I mean, this was Kennedy that, and goddamn Kennedy this, because everybody knew that the contract was going to the contractor that the Eisenhower administration had set up. Things like that create pressures. Saying he's not going to put Americans in Vietnam. That war ran to a minimum cost of $220 billion, probably all up $500 million, billion dollars. People will kill for money like that. They'll kill for contracts within that. Ten million men were flown to Saigon by commercial airline. It was worth a billion dollars. They wouldn't have gone. So when you create that kind of pressure, you create what it takes to murder a president. And the decision then is very clean, handled by a few people. The gunmen come from outside the United States. Nobody knows about it. There's no Cubans involved. There's no mafia involved. There's no this involved. All these people that talk about it, that's cover story. Cover story is the most difficult thing to run. That's been running 30 years now. And think of the pressures that cover story has been creating over the last 30 years to keep it up front, to have really famous, intelligent newspaper men say, 
There is no substantive history, anything except that Oswald killed Kennedy, and so on and so on. So I mean, this this is it's a cover story. It's ridiculous. The American Medical Association trotted these poor old autopsy people out, and were saying, oh well, now the bullet went this way and went through Kennedy, came out of his neck, of course, and went down in a Connolly, broke his wrist right through his head. Right. Uh, exactly. You know. A cover story is a terrible thing to create. Murder is simple. Just a little scalpel and you do it. I hate to break off at this point, and I wish we had another three hours to continue because we've really just barely scratched the surface. But I want to just at this point say, Colonel Fletcher Prouty, thank you very much for being with us here. Uh, your book is one of the most thought-provoking and critical pieces of historiography that I, for one, have ever read, and I think it's essential reading for anyone trying to get to the bottom of contemporary history. Uh, this is Jeff Steinberg, and I want to thank you for being with us today for the LaRouche Connection.